Okay. Hello, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you as always. I remember the first, you remember the first time um, you saw me? I remember the first time I saw you. <laughs> it's so, a long time. I, I don't want to go back how long ago it was. Hey, it was a while back. As long as we remember it, that's okay. I yeah. was, I was, uh, I might, you know, I was coming from Hong Kong to Bolletieri. Right, right. And, um, you know, all the coaches at Bolteri at the time, I'm sure still is, they're so intense, right? And I was never in a group, you know, settings. I was always individual training with my dad. And then I arrived in Florida, everybody is like serious and I barely spoke English. And then I was like, but I saw this one person, I'm like, he's smiling. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to that person. <laughs> That was the first memory of wow. you that I remember. It was like you were always a smiley coach, made it more welcoming. Yeah. Speaking of that, though, I got to I got to bring up the passing of Steve Owens last yeah. week, which was really sad. Of, of the group of guys, he was a he was a special guy that was in our in our group of coaches back then, and uh, yeah, really really surprising and saddening to hear that this last week. But I, 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 I yeah, you know what? You're right. Of the family, the Bolitari family that we we are, he I think he's the first right in in our group. That's group. Yeah. Passes. Well, Mike, Mike Henderson passed away last year also. Um, and, oh, Mike and, Henderson. Uh, I don't remember Mike. I don't Mike, Mike did a lot more of the physical conditioning stuff um, okay. with the group, but yeah, he he was the first one that died suddenly last year and then Steve this year. So that, that, those are that's, that's okay. shows our age a little bit, but the both special guys and we yeah. miss for sure. For sure. For sure. And, you know, and we'll, we'll make him proud with continuing our journey in the tennis world. At least yeah. I am. I know you got out of tennis. <laughs> I am still in tennis in a lot of ways. Yeah. So um, how long were you the head coach at University of Tennessee? I was at Tennessee 30 years. I was at Arkansas for a year and I was at Kentucky for a few years before that. Um, you know, and then I was at Boletaries before that. So about a 40 year career. So 40 year career. Okay. So I bet you like the most memorable and fun ride is uh, with the women's team. <laughs> oh, wait. You know, I've actually Am I had putting a... you on the spot. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, I had a lot of great times. I mean, really did. We, you know, over those years, you have the highs and the lows. Um, as you've been away from it more, you seem to remember all the highs a lot more than you do the lows. Um, or at least I try to remember the, the highs a lot more than the lows. But uh, you get everything. And, you know, dealing with, I was a men's coach for a year out of those 33 or 34 years in college coaching. And, you know, I dealt with a lot of females and guys when I was at Volatari's. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of different chemistry, um, different teams, you know, some were very cohesive, some weren't. And, uh, you know, that's that's the fun part about tennis is you get different makeups all the time of what comprises a team. Wow. I tell you, though, 30 years, uh, you know, the tour obviously is competitive, but people don't realize how competitive college tennis is. Oh, very competitive. You know, everyone's wanting to win and. Um, you know, everyone's trying hard and being honest, there's probably not enough great players to go around. So you're having, you know, yeah, you're dealing really, you know, tough work trying to get the right recruits. That is a tough age too. You're talking about teenage years. You're getting the, the really tough years of the, you know, of their age uh, coming in, you know, the 18 years with their uh, testosterone and, you know, egos and, you know, it, it, girls and boys, really. Sure. I mean, I, you know, as I've been away almost five years now, you know, you, you look back and you realize when you're in the rat race and you're on the treadmill going every day, um, you know, it's nice to be able to sit back and watch. I go to the matches now here at Tennessee and watch the girls and the guys play. And, you know, it's really relaxed and I enjoy watching them compete. But, you know, I get to go home. And I, I don't have to grab a bottle of Tums or Maalox or anything when I'm done. I'm, I, I go back and, you know, I'll sit down on my deck and take a look at the lake and, and enjoy myself. But, uh, yeah, it's fun to watch them compete. But, you know, there is a lot of stress. And I think the coaches when you're in it don't realize how stressful it is until you're done and then you can look back and once your body has that big exhale and you can really relax um and, and kind of take a real good look at it and have a good perspective 
Uh, well, absolutely. It's, it's like you work all day and you're running around all day until you say you don't realize how exhausted you are until you sit down and you're like, you know. Well, so you that, basically do it for a career because you're never off. I mean, I, I that was the thing I think I probably could have done better during my career is I would have probably taken more time off. I really never took time off in 30 something years. And uh, well, you're just con constantly recruiting, constantly working with the team, constantly doing something for the program. Um, and then you know, it probably wasn't healthy and you, you're probably better off taking some breaks in there and, and not pushing so hard. Um, but it's easy to see that now than it was when I was, when I was doing it. Well, that for sure. However, you know, your knowledge helps to the audience, the listening, maybe at some point they want to be a college coach, you know, what to do, but that's also true in life itself. Anyways, when you, when you have another profession now right we we tend to be we're the go-getters right we just go 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 but i'm sure what you think what you your knowledge with experience now would do differently in college sense will probably apply to your your profession now oh yeah you know we deal i deal with people some now we have a business and we have employees and uh yeah i think those all the experiences you have especially after you've kind of taken a step back are really helpful in trying to help people and manage them their careers and help help your business so yeah it's very very useful i was gonna ask you like what what would you have done differently in your coaching career was that the only thing oh gosh you know you could always hindsight sites 2020 but uh no i don't think i'd change too much i mean you know you're you're dealt a hand a lot of times where you are at school and what administration you have and how much support you're getting so you you know you're trying to push the envelope all the time and you're the your own toughest critic um you know but i mean trying to find the right people to fit in your program because there's all different kinds um you know i've learned a lot actually for over the last 10 15 years watching my nephews go through the college tennis process and both of them have you know, they, neither one were ever going to be a professional tennis player. One played on a national championship caliber team. The other one didn't. Uh, one's become the doctor. He graduates this next month and, um, you know, listen to his perspective on what he really wanted to get out of college was was interesting versus what the other one who played on the championship team. You know, he's you know, trying to become a doctor is a, is a tough road. And, uh, you know, he spent all his time studying and doing that. And he kind of wishes sometimes he wasn't on as competitive a team as he was because he could have spent more time with his studies. So that's, you know, you learn those things. And when you're in there grinding as a coach, you want to get the maximum out of every player you have on your team all the time. And some of those kids, you know, who are striving to be doctors or whatever, it's hard, you know, that's, that's a full-time or more than a full-time job in itself. So, you know, learn how to deal with that is, is important. And you don't learn that until later. Yeah. The balance act, isn't it? A student athlete. And then what major are you taking? Um, sure. That has a lot to do with it. Uh, you know, you were such a, an accomplished coach. You've trained, you know, you worked with, play a lot of high performance players, elite players, um, you know, and then college tennis. When you get um, a player who has the potential, because you, when you've been in the game as long as we have, you can spot potential and, and work with them. How do you help? Because you have, how many, how many players did you have on the team? Uh, between eight and 12. Eight, 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 eight and 10 were a great number. Uh, when it got over that, it was really hard to just because the way you travel and all those things, it's really hard to keep more than that number right. engaged and happy and, and uh, training well enough to, to be competitive. You had one assistant coach. Did you have a, had a, have a volunteer? And we had a volunteer too, you know, over different, over different times. Um, but yeah, we had some, we had some great volunteers, which are really helpful. Um, especially as you get older to have a younger volunteer, who's not afraid to get out there and still mix it up on the court is, is nice. Yeah, the, I'm, I feel like you, that's it, right? That's the junior apprentice, right? The, the, the volunteer right. coach, you know. So when you have eight to 10 or 12 players and then there are a few, maybe one or two that could maybe have the ambition to go further on the tour after sure. or during whatever, how do you work with your training you know, during the training sessions? Because you do have individuals there. Yeah, I mean, we really never changed much. You know, we were all trying to be competitive. Um, you know, I tried to get the most out of all of them. Um, you know, the ones who wanted to do more, 
you work with them, you know, you, you make it more competitive for them. You set the goals higher, you encourage them to play during their breaks. Um, you know, they would come back and have access to facilities that they needed to work on something by themselves or do something, crank the music up, turn the ball machine on, work on one shot for a while. And, and the kids who went out and played for me, that's what they did. You know, they would, they would do extra on their own and, uh, you know, we're a little limited. It wasn't like at Voluntary's we could work you guys night and day and, and, and That's all true. that. That's and the college, college, we have time frames and, uh, you know, parameters that we have to deal with. But the ones who really want to excel, you, you can set it up and make it really competitive for them. The weight training that they get and some of the other things, you know, like you said, a lot of it's better than what the pros have access to. So, um, <laughs> it's you know, crazy. It, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just how bad they want it, you know, because it is a juggling act, you know, they're, they are in school and if they do have a very difficult major, it's really tough unless you're an exceptional student and not everybody I had over the years were exceptional students. They were, you know, good students, but you know, it's, it's tough to take the, the hard major route and then try to blend in competitive D1 college athletics. Yeah, I mean, times have changed in the, in the, I want to talk a little bit how you did recruiting during the, the times when we were not, there was no lockdown, such thing as lockdown. What was your, the normal routine of your recruiting process? Yeah, I did a lot. I'd watch, I went to a lot of tournaments and I watched players and just wanted to see, you know, the competitiveness, the talent wise, what, what kind of desire they had, um, you know, and, and it changed over the years too, you know, as, uh, you know, the, the base of kids kind of changed a little bit and international recruiting opened up more. I, I recruited mostly American kids during my time, probably 80, some 90% were Americans. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's changed over time. You know, yeah. I'm, I, I watched our team, Tennessee's team the other day, and it's probably almost reverse than that, you know, so it's probably 20% American and 80% international. Uh, on their team now but you know that changed things too because now you're you're traveling overseas the internet now has become you know, your main tool of looking where my main tool were my eyes you know I'd go to the orange bowl or I'd go to the nationals and I'd go to, to the sectional tournaments and and watch players and, and and watch them quite a bit and see them in a lot of different um, spaces and bring them to campus and then you know try to try to see, you know, if you're on the same page. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably the one thing that, you know, student athletes really, they need to be honest with themselves and with their coaches because the coaches, you know, they're, they're trying to let you know what it's going to be about and you don't to sell yourself to something that you don't really want to be a part of is not good for anybody. You know, so if you, if you want to work that hard at, you know, as the top 25 programs, you know, that, that's a commitment and that's there's a lot of work involved there and if you're trying to say hey I want to be a part of that because it's a cool school or whatever but you don't want to do the work then that's going to be a bad fit and uh, I think the ones you know who want to do the work um, yeah they'll fit in fine the ones who get to a big school and then um, don't really want to push themselves or work that hard and now with the transfer portal they can, they can switch and there's a lot of kids that switch all the time now so that that's different too that's a whole different avenue than didn't exist a few years ago well i guess that came around because of covid right well it was actually the portal the, the portal was happening before covid okay and, you know i think just now it's 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 commonplace though now you know if you're not starting you're not happy or whatever you have a you know you have a way to to go somewhere else in an easy way and before you know you, you would have to sit out a year or really make yeah. a decision to do it and now and it's kind of just perfect for the times, I guess. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the student athletes have all changed, um, you know, and kids now are, are great kids. They're just different kids, you know, and the makeup, um, what makes up the current athlete is different than what it made up your group. And it's different than the kids that were 10 years after you and 10 years after that. And the group now is totally different. Um, parents are different and you know just the way they were brought up are different so I mean you have to I think the new modern coach is a lot more social media savvy yeah. than coaches like myself um they're a lot you know the modern one can they can deal with the millennial children and parents and I probably wasn't very good at doing that uh, you know the last <laughs> year and I, I wasn't designed to, to to 
to coddle and do some of the things that you have to do now to be successful. Um, but you know, that that's part of the new, what the new successful coach is going to be able to do is they're going to have to, you know, work with the new athlete and, uh, and get the most out of them with, with the new ways you have to work with kids. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm 50, 50 on that, that, that portal thing, because to me, it, it's, there's a lot of learn. There's a learning curve for a student athlete to go to college, let's say sure. four years. Right. You know, it's just like any relationship, right? The first year I call it the honeymoon. Everything is great. You know, that student athlete is fresh, you know, it's new, new environment away from home to all jazz and the coach of a new, you know, prospect, you know, just impressive player. And then the second year, that's when like, okay, honeymoon phase is over. Now let's go reality. And I just think with this portal, if you don't give it time, because ultimately everyone goes through challenges, you know, sure. player, coach, you know, anything. And with that portal sitting there, oh, I'm not happy. So they go, whoop, they go in this portal, they go somewhere else, but then they're gonna, they're bringing the same challenges with them. So, you know, there's good and bad in there, you know? Well, like, it's a learning curve, like learn through, especially for youngsters, like coaches like you who've been there 30 years, you know how to handle every situation because you've dealt with so many of them, you know, but for these kids, they have to learn to, to deal with the challenges. Well, I think it makes coaches biggest job roster management um, because you don't ever know who's going to be there at the end of the year. You know, you know, the kids who aren't get, making the starting lineup are probably not going to want to stick around if they're competitive at all because they're going to want to play. I understand that totally, you know, but, but the ones that you have a little disagreement with, or you push too hard or whatever, you know, it's an easy way for them to, to get out and go somewhere else. Yeah. And that's fine. But, you know, old school 20 years ago, they would have had to overcome and learn how to deal with that problem. Right. And, and, you know, there's, there's some good things to the portal because if you're in a bad situation for you, like I said, if you maybe got, went to a place thinking, it was one thing and it's totally the other. Or if you went there and thought, well, I can deal with it. I know it's going to be tough, but, but then it's really tough and, and it's tougher than what you want. Then, you know, you should be able to find a new, new place. Cause there's all different levels, you know, of competitiveness and how hard they're working all up and down the spectrum. So, yeah, I mean, for coaches, the roster management thing is tough. I know I, I watch basketball. I mean, you're having to re-recruit your team all the time. So you're spending a lot of time, doing that and then you know then if you don't you're out in the portal trying to find players to replace them with and um yeah it's just a it, it's a whole nother thing that's that's added to a coach's plate and as for an athlete it gives you a kind of an easy way out to to go somewhere else um but like you said they still take the problems with them and they don't always fix just because you you switched homes Exactly. Um, and I want to go at touch base a little bit because um, I speak a lot with the players I work with, you know, they all, they all get really nervous and can't play when, you know, there's a school they're interested in and then they know the coach is coming to watch them. And there was one year, um, this girl, yeah, she could, I mean, she would serve and the serve would bounce on her side that's how nervous she, she yeah. got and she was like oh my god you know i'm never gonna get it. they're never gonna give me a scholarship give me your feedback on that well i've got a couple of good stories for that i mean two of my favorite players that i ever had here at tennessee neither one of them really performed well when i was out watching i could tell that they had a lot of talent and they had a lot of heart and they were good fighters and all that and i'm not going to use their names because i don't want to embarrass them but they were one of them, I didn't see ever win a match actually until she came to school and she became one of the better players we ever had here and, and played for quite a while on the tour afterwards. Um, but yeah, just got nervous, got tight and stuff and, and trying to you know, overperform. And, uh, you know, that never works, works real well. And the other one, you know, just had all the eyes on her, had a lot of um, every, a lot of interest from a lot of coaches and just couldn't make it happen under the, under the, the lights of the camera and uh, but ended up becoming a great player too and just needed to but, but I think coaches you know coaches know what they're doing they're, they're going to see the talent they're going to see the desire and then hopefully you can help overcome those nerves as as you get in there and you, as you prepare and your preparation gets better and you know you can rely on some other things you know and and control your nerves or at least learn how to deal with them right now 
before you go on your recruiting trips, right? Do you, what gets your attention? Is it like by their national ranking, by the WTA slash ATV ranking? We didn't have UTR at the time. Yeah, no, back then we, you know, you had to use a lot of your, your eyeballs actually to go actually watch people. But now, you know, UTR kind of gets you within a grouping. You kind of know, you know, if you're a 10 or an 11 or a 12, what, where you can fit in, you know, if you get a girl that's a 12, you know, she's going to be able to play. Even if she's not playing well, she's still going to play at a real well, good level. Same with an 11. And then, you know, your 10s for your top 25 teams, you got to find kids with potential who are going to look to improve and become that 11. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of the trick, but it gives you, especially with a lot of the international recruits, it gives you a base of like, okay, I know she's in this group. Where in that group, you don't really know, but you know, at least you know, she's in the ballpark. Right. Yeah, the, the ballpark, because, um, you know, they, they used to be, I hope we don't anymore. It was so common girls that, um, you know, they're looking to go to this top 25 schools and all of a sudden you see them trying to play a lot of tournaments. <laughs> And then they stop, you know, I, you know, that's where I kind of like UTR because if you don't play that your UTR is going to get affected. Right. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think it's a great tool for the coaches now to have a UTR, especially because the recruiting pool, you know, instead of having to fly over to Czechoslovakia or somewhere, you at least have an idea. And then if it's worth going over, you know, if there's someone you really are interested in, you'll know they're close to where your level needs to be and you can go see if they're the, they have the makeup to help you out. Um, yeah, because that will save, like you said, it will save a lot of coaches, you know, trip because you're like being okay that that UTR is the, in the range I'm looking for. Right. Because then you fly and look at the player and then because, you know, it's not just their talent or competitive ability, but you also want to see if they're a team player. Right. No, I mean, ideally you get the, you get the perfect threat. You know, the, the one that's a, a leader who's got great passion, who, you know, is a great teammate and uh, plus have a ton of talent, but you know, th those don't come around that often. And when you do, you, you want to make sure that, that you grab a hold of those guys. Yep. And like all that, all the top 50 schools will go after this yeah. one. Yeah. One you're, recruiting, you're recruiting yeah. against everybody that you can't recruit against, you know, that's, all, that's always the case. Right. So um, you're tuning in, you're, you're living in, where are you? I'm in Knoxville. I, I went to, I lived in Charleston for about a year after I was done. And then I moved back here and, uh, you know, we, like I said, we're, we've got, we've got projects galore here. We're, we're found a little place on the lake and, and are just going nonstop fixing everything up. You're definitely not bored. That, that's no, what no, I'm no, here. Board, board is not what I am. I'm enjoying no, you. No, you are not. So I, I'm in Toronto. We moved here in 2015. And right now, like two days ago, we were put back into a lockdown. I, you know, I don't even know what they call it now. They call it all sorts of shutdown, lockdown, emoji, whatever it is. It's still a lockdown to me. Um, no. This is like the third time where in the U.S., Americans will never feel it because all you know is this COVID still, you know, and the vaccine, right? But right. You, you're functional over there. You're, fun yeah. you're functional. Well, in, in Toronto, in Ontario, in Canada, um, the clubs uh, are not a lot of programs. Wow. Right. Uh, luckily, in some parts of Canada, Toronto, you know, weather wise is bearable to play outside. So there are some nets outside at the public parks and outdoor facilities um, in the in the west, uh, the Midwest coast of Alberta. It's still too cold and there are no nets. So depending right. on where you are. Right. But wherever you are in Canada right now, there are no programs. So tennis is super restricted. It's been happening since December. So it's so uh, we have not. I know the club that I'm at that Eve, my husband, he's the director at. They've we've been they've been locked down since December wow. <laughs> and open for one week, closed down again, open for like four days, I think. And so now is another news. So my question to you is, you know, oh, and we've not had a tournament in Canada. Right. Not one tournament. So obviously, you know, with the no competition in Canada, it, it affects the UTR tremendously. Sure. With that in mind, back with the first lockdown back March last year, 
So my husband and, and another tennis director, they, they formed this next uh, tennis gen. Uh, it, it's a league with, it's a U, with UTR rank points involved, mm-hmm. college format, co-ed. So oh. yeah, so it's fantastic. So how, they have teams. I was a coach in one of the teams. So that's as close as I get into a college coach, a team. No, coach. no, you, you're you're a mother of two college players, so that that gets you even closer. Yes, yeah, and, and of course, yeah, I went to UCLA, so I had a little, of course, years ago, right? Um, so I have, yeah, so I had a little bit of an idea of you know the college format, and uh, but um, so they got this this leak going. They talked to UTR, was able to give awarded uh, points. Uh, and it's co-ed, which is really fun, right? So because the whole idea is not, or is to provide opportunities for a nine playing a higher or getting the competition, really to keep competition alive. Right. So how valuable do you think a project like that? For well, it, keeps, it keeps them playing because I think that's the hardest thing that we're at. Like you said, our, you know, we're, I've been vaccinated now for a month and a half or two months. Had our, I've had our second vaccine already. So, you know, we're out and about in, um, in, in my brother's club. Um, I don't know if you remember Scott or not, but he, yes. yeah, he's, he's, he's still running a club here in Knoxville. The they, one with that, that hill that you can't yeah. get up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, you know, it yes. well. so that, that's yeah. And uh, he, uh, but, you know, they've been, they're, they're programming, they're running tournaments and they're, they're doing stuff here. They're, you know, he's still working with kids. They were locked down for a while last year for a few months. And then as summer kind of came on, they've opened up a little bit and, and um, you know, there's a lot of activity going on. Actually clubs are pretty busy because it's great, great app, you know, Avenue for people to get exercise and stuff during COVID. And um, you know, so that that's been good and we've got it going here. I know on the college end, it's tough because the coaches can't go out and see the kids and they've been, they've been locked down for, for a while. So how this is all going to play out over the next year or two is, you know, these kids that are in school have been in school for five or six years now, you know, they, they're the fifth year and six year seniors, um, which, which means there's little room for freshmen coming in. There's a lot less opportunities, you know, so how that's going to kind of, transition i'm not so sure and then you know how much aid is available is probably limited at least for the next year or so so i don't i don't know how they're going to handle that so much i i I know they're all hoping my friends that are still working um you know that they they can't wait to get back out there and and see some kids again and and try to do it but i also know they have limited opportunities because they have a lot of kids that are staying and taking advantage of that extra year um you know so that it's a tough, tough for the incoming kids coming up in high school right now, because I think all the high school kids, I know, um, you know, it's different sports besides tennis, I mean, softball, soccer, all those kind of things, you know, recruiting has been tough. You know, they hadn't even taken ACT, you know, yeah. tests or anything like that over the last year. Um, yeah. It's just a different world and everyone's having to adapt. Wow. Well, that's the thing because Canada, even though we are neighbors to the U.S., we are considered international, you know, yeah. and the cost to recruit an international is higher than when you have in-state players, correct? Well, a lot easier access to go up and see someone who's a half hour away versus 10 hours away. Correct. And then especially yeah. right now, because, you know, you just can't travel freely anyway, so um international travel is real limited uh you know we we didn't go anywhere for 14 months and then went on our first trip you know a few weeks ago after our vaccinations it, we felt a little safer traveling but i know for a college coach who's not able to travel um it'll be interesting to see when they lift that recruiting kind of um mandate that they have that they can't get out and hopefully they'll be able to get out and start seeing kids again and and get back in the normal flow um on i don't know if you remember this on average how many emails were you getting a day a week for kids wanting to come yeah i mean you know gosh quite a few but i mean you know it's it's how many of them were kids that you 
would fit in your program? You know, probably not as many. Um, you know, some of the top five or 10 schools or especially some of the really good academic institutions were, are probably getting hundreds of emails a week, um, you know, if, and I don't know how they deal with them. You, you try to respond to everybody, but not, not everyone's going to get a great letter back uh, when you're doing that many. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of emails, but if there's some, if we ever got an email from someone who fit in our, our profile, you know, would be able to compete there. I'd certainly take a real good look at them for sure. Okay. So this is a fun one. Um, you know, obviously all there's so many kids wanting to go to college every year, you know, with a scholarship, that's a tennis, right? But what type of email, what type of videos, you know, get your attention? Wow. Um, somebody's pretty much, like you said, if you're getting quite a few, you want something that's fairly much to the point. So you don't need a lot of fluff in there. You know, you need to know <laughs> their, their UTR, good wins that they had rankings i mean you know it's all at your access any nowadays as a coach anymore but you know something to, to make me look you up um you know give me that information you know if you're telling me you're a utr that's 11 and i'm at a top 25 school i'm gonna probably take a look and see what what else i need to know and then you know what your desires are what you're looking for give them good contact information what's the best way to reach you all that type of stuff um, is helpful well, I've helped a few players, uh, you know, whether they train with me while well, they train with me because I do mental training now. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm not, you know, I, I'm organic. I, whoever's coming my way, I'm not promoting, promoting any clubs. So when they come to me for help, the, the juniors, um, you know, and of course we talk about college a lot. So my, how I advise them is, you know, when, when they do a profile video, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, before we go there, I would say, okay, in the States, do we still have the, the blue chip thing going on in the States or no? They do. They, they do. do. Tennis recruiting okay. still stills out there. Yeah. Okay. So that was trying to explain, because we don't have the blue chip thingy here in, in right. Canada, right? So I was trying to explain to them, if you're not the blue chip players, you fall into the a, a large pool, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not the, the superstars group, you <clears throat> fall into that big group. And you cannot do the same of what everybody does because then it's going to get lost in this pond of right. like a thousand players, right? If you're the mediocre-ish uh, UTR or, or level. So my advice to them is like, look, when you do a profile video, you know, don't, you, the don'ts and the do's. Don't just say your name when you graduate and that you're looking for a scholarship. Of course, everyone is looking for a scholarship, but do introduce yourself. You know, mind you, go with the, the, the idea that the coach gets to know you. You're watching a movie. Give them a summary. Give somebody a summary. Uh, you know, what your character is like, what your strengths are. Don't be afraid to talk about your weaknesses because it's real. You cannot be a perfect because perfection doesn't exist. So, you know, it may be like I'm really strong. Uh, my my style of game is aggressive baseliner. I have a great wide serve and followed by forehand. However, emotionally, I get a little sucked in. <laughs> Everybody understands that, right? So, but I, I'm working on getting emotionally, you know, stronger, more resilient. I'm working with Patricia. No I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's like now the coach is seeing somebody real, is getting a feel. You know, I I I really love playing on the two side and the doubles. Now it gives you more detail to the coach. Okay, doubles, it gives the co coach a vision. And then on the videos, I'm like, don't stick these boring two minutes cross courts, serves, volleys. I'm like, no, put a if you have a doubles video, put a doubles video in there. Because that is the first thing that comes to mind. It's a very important part of, of college tennis. Um, you know, a snippet, no more than 30 seconds. Another snippet of like some points. Okay, if you want to throw in how great you look in drills, fine. Put one in there and then put a lengthy, a full match. If the coach, after the three snippets, wants to see how you deal with a full match, by all means, put the full match on. So that's the kind of advice I'm giving to them. Uh, spot on or wrong. No, I think it's great advice. And I, I, and again, there's so many different levels in college tennis. So the schools that don't have the big budgets, those kind of videos right there are going to be pay dividends because 
you're going to get, you know, if you're in that pool of players and you're not the blue chip or the five-star recruit wh who people are seeking out, that's, you know, because, and those are limited. So we we'll say I've got a hundred people in the country or the world that I can recruit that can actually play on our team. That really limits my pool. So if I'm getting letters from the, the other 3000 kids that probably won't make my lineup, you know, I, I don't, I can't spend a lot of time with those because I'm going to try to spend my time trying to work with the, the top hundred that can play if, but there's so many schools out there that you that those other 3000 will fit into and fit in nicely. And that's going to help those coaches because they don't have the budget to come see you or meet you. And they're going to have to, you know, give them something, reason to call you. And that, that sounds like your, your video would, would give you a reason. Hey, it's a neat kid. You know, this is a great, great student athlete. The kid will fit in great in our program. Let me write him a letter or give him a call. And the, the second, of course, like you said earlier, I have two kids at OSU now, so that, uh, and I'm sure throughout your co uh, coaching career in college, uh, there are some girls maybe was better suited at another school. Sure. What would your advice be to parents and, and players, student athletes, you know, what should they be looking at to be the best match? Of course, we never know until you get there, but would be a good idea to look at. Yeah, like I, I've talked to you before, I think being honest, you know, is, is really important because you, I've had a lot of kids over the years who want to play at a big time program, want to be a part of that, but I think they want to be a part of the show and yeah. not actually be a part of what it takes because to be a part of that is really hard work. And, you know, it's a, a level of dedication that not everyone has. And, and I understand that. But if you, you know, if you're going to tell the coach, yeah, that's me, I'm, I'm the get up early, work late kind of person. And I've got it because, you know, especially now, I think college recruiting has become so much about, or I mean, just tennis in general and any sport for that matter. It's about recruiting yeah. because in my early days, I could take players and work with them and push them hard enough to be good enough to play at our place. But it took a lot of pushing and a lot of hard work. And nowadays you really, it's very difficult to push the athletes that hard. And so, because you can't, they might not be good enough to play at your place if they're just coming in there and resting on their laurels or just letting their talent take over. It's probably not enough. So, you know, makes your recruiting pool even a little bit smaller, but you're pro the kid's probably gonna be happier if, they're honest and like, look, I'm going to fit in at this mid major and I'm going to be able to play and I'm not going to get pushed to death, but I can still compete and have a great time and be a part of this program. Or I go to the D one major program coaches on me every day because my best is probably not quite good enough. And so they're on me every day about getting better and it's too stressful for me. Well, you know, go to the mid major and be a star yeah. and, and, and be somebody and you'll have a great time. And instead of being the one that, you know, if there's to have that, that wanting to be great. And that's kind of what you need to be. If you're um, going to a D one program is you want to be great because it is really competitive, you know, and if you're not that competitive, you're not that driven or you don't have those 10 things that you can do without talent. Um, you probably should look for a little bit better fit for you. So it, I'm hearing it's better, what my dad likes to call it a big fish in a small pond. So you want yes. to be great. Yeah. You know, don't be looking so far out if you're going to be miserable. Well, I mean, I, I can be honest. I mean, a lot of, I've watched now a lot of coaches, a lot of guys who have academies. Um, you know, we look back at our days, you know, that, Hey, you're getting to go to UCLA. Well, that's a big, you know, for the coach that's, Hey, my player's going to UCLA. Well, kid goes there and is playing seven at UCLA not happy you know and the coach is on them every day because you know you got to really push and and yeah, that that's where they enter the transfer portal where if they went to some other place maybe not quite as um well known or prestigious or whatever um but they would have had a great time and would have had a, a real been a really good fit there and so yeah it, you know you want to have players that you're developing try to go to the best place they can but you also want them to go to a place where they fit and, you know, if you know that their work ethic is not just perfect and stellar, then maybe back down a little bit to where, you know, what you do is going to fit nicely in this, this program. 
and you're going to be talented enough to be to excel and do well if you go here you know if you go to ohio state and they want to be a top five team and you're not a top five player unless you're pushing it you know 100 percent every day maybe not the right place to go yep absolutely you know i I see the the college um, I, the the picture that I you know envision for college. Of course, I experienced it. And my kids are there now, and I want to bring this across to the audience: is that when you get a scholarship to this with you know college, you should look at it like you being employed into this company, and you have to have a good representation. You have to be able to go in to work every single day and bring your absolute best um you know and that's it's, it's like a job they're going into you know and i feel like a lot of the youngsters that oh i got a scholarship and then go in just like you said if they're not used to get you know to be worked at really hard when they're younger and they go get a scholarship to go there and it's like oh my gosh it's like you know they're shocked and then the coach gets hard the coach is like your boss is that you got to you know the coach has to perform the coach because he has you know the team the recruiting team and then you need to perform because it, it's like a, a um, you know it's a rotation right it's like for for and that's also when the performances come in and that is sponsorship we're talking about yeah i mean i, I think the, you know the whole thing when it comes down to it is you, you you're trying to find that great fit the one that works for you both socially academically and athletically and um you know sometimes surrounding influences of you think that you should be someplace maybe that you might not need to be you know and it's i don't know if it's coaches or parents or whatever but that prestige factor um you know it runs high i mean i think that's that is tennis is really you know i mean we just went through all that recruiting scandal the last year oh. of all that going on but, that, but that's true because people want their kids to go to those prestigious yeah. schools there's so many great places to go to school and, you know, to, to go to one of those places, you know, and you're expected to perform athletically, you need to perform. And I mean, it's, it's hard work and it's a lot of dedication and not everyone's cut out to, to push themselves quite that far, especially, you know, um, right now. And I think, yeah, make them being honest with yourself. How hard do I want to work? There's some kids who want to push themselves and, and be great. You know, I think that was when your group, when you came to the academy, if you looked around, you, know, you might have saw my smiling face, but you also saw 30 other girls who all wanted the same thing you did. You know, and, and I think that was excellent back then because every, everywhere, every court I went on with every, you know, bunch of students, everyone was trying to be great, you know, and your work ethic was, you know, amazing. So like when I went to college and all of a sudden I'd get a couple of players who didn't have that, I was like frustrating. You're like, oh. why, where, where are the Patricias and the, you know, Jenny Purdy's and the Marianne Wardell's and all those girls, you know, who wanted it every day. And, you know, Ann Gross, you know, the, those, those kids are hard to find. And, uh, you know, when you, especially when I got spoiled early, cause I had everywhere, everywhere I looked, everyone wanted it so bad, you know, and then you go to college and not everyone was quite in that same you know they all weren't trying to, to get to the top and uh we're, we're content and so they're not hungry but, enough yeah i mean so you know you guys were all hungry yeah. and then you go into a college environment and like you said maybe you have one or two girls on the team that are really hungry and, and the other six are real good contributors but you know you're like hey come up for some extra practice or you know that's not <laughs> that doesn't fit in their their schedule so um, I remember, you know, it's funny you said that because um, I remember back, uh, you know, I go to school because we had to work so hard, you know, yeah. in, in, at voluntary. And my first year at school was like, I, I was getting frustrated because it was easy. Right. Like the training was not the same. And I was get, getting frustrated at you. I was like, wait, you know, we didn't do enough of this. We didn't do enough. We got to do more, you know. But it's funny how we get so conditioned in a certain way. And then, you know, we bring it to an, our environment. And I really hope the audience, the young audience looking for you to go to, to school, you know, be, you know, get all the tips and, and live it, you know, there you have great tips in there. Um, it's not just about talent, it's the competition, team player, 
be honest. Most and foremost, the most important thing is be honest with yourself and, um, and then go in and go to, you know, don't go for prestige, go for a line where it fits you. The middle is okay. Be a big fish in a small pond. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you. That thank is you. first class chat. Always a pleasure. I'm going to have to come visit you soon. Yeah, you come down when you get your knees done. Yeah, I know. Can you can you just call my um, orthopedic? Like, hey, she gets to, to you know she needs to get her knees done. You got get both them. knees done. Yeah, yeah. Get them get them done and uh, get get down here. I'd love to come watch your kids play up there in, in Columbus sometime. Uh, oh, so ho hopefully yes. we'll travel and and uh, by next year I can come watch. By next year, what do you mean? Well, by hope, when when COVID, when they let more fans in and stuff, I can't wait. Oh, to too. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I know. I keep forgetting about these things. Well, Mike, take care of the knees. Take care of All your right. best of luck with your project, and we will meet up in Columbus. Sounds good. Talk to you. Thank later. you. Okay. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye bye.